Hi, I'm Bear with BearIndependent.com in today for RefugeMedical.com in our ongoing conversation around the March algorithm and tactical combat casualty care. Today in episode three, we're discussing wound packing, which is the second way that we're going to deal with critical bleeds, which represent 90% of the preventable deaths in the United States of America for civilians. Not for law enforcement officers, not for fire and EMS, not for combat vets, for civilians. 90% of preventable deaths in the United States are related to uncontrolled bleeds. So we talked in the previous video, if you haven't seen that, go check it out. We talked about tourniquets, tourniquet applications, the different types of tourniquets, what's go, what's no go, so forth and so on. Tourniquets work on our extremities. We're going to talk today about wound packing in what are called our junctional areas, which is going to be our neck and our shoulders and our pelvic girdle and our rear end. Okay, so basically your sockets, your shoulder sockets, your hip sockets. We can't put a tourniquet on this because as it moves, the tourniquet will work itself loose. When the tourniquet comes loose, the bleed continues, the person can exsanguinate, they can bleed out and die. And we wanna prevent that. We wanna keep the blood inside the body. What we're doing is we're buying time when we do this so that we can elevate to a higher level of care. Whether this is our first responders, our EMTs and paramedics, or we're driving somebody to the hospital or whatever it may be, we're buying that casualty time so that they don't die. So let's talk about wound packing. This is a trainer kit. Uh, when you come to Refuge Training, by the way, you can go to our site, refugetraining.com, national tour dates up. When you come to Refuge Training, you get one of these to keep. And the reason I'm gonna tear this open is because I need the pressure bandage and the packing gauze that's inside of here. So, pull this open. It's got a zip top bag. These are all North American Rescue components that are in here. As you can see, North American Rescue right there. Super good stuff. So, industry leader in trauma medicine components. So, in here, we have a six inch pressure bandage and we have some combat gauze, simulated combat gauze, which is a hemostatic agent. We're gonna come back to the rest of this kit in further videos. It also has a blue trainer tourniquet in here. This is the exact same tourniquet as this black one, the tactical one, other than the fact that it's blue. Two of the lives that have been saved at Refuge Medical have been directly attributed to blue trainer tourniquets where somebody came to class, they took the class, they had this blue tourniquet on them, and they were able to render aid in a moment of crisis and save somebody's life. So I think that's super cool. And you keep this stuff when you take the class, okay? So that goes in there, that goes in there. And the last thing I need is a package of compressed gauze. Compressed gauze versus combat gauze. Combat gauze uh, is what is called a hemostatic. It has a, a type of clay in it called uh, kaolin clay that's in here. And what that does is it, it's made by a company called Quick Clot. It's not instant clot, it's quick clot. And that takes the clotting time in the wound channel from about 10 minutes to about three minutes. There's lots of factors in there, but from about three minutes, from I'm sorry, from about 10 minutes to about three minutes. Combat gauze is super expensive. Compressed gauze is not. We include combat gauze or quick clot rolled gauze in many of our different kits, you know, whether it's the ARC or the SOB or the Bear Fac or any of the other kits that we have. Um, because Bleeding in our pelvic girdle is really where I want to use this, okay? In our shoulders, in our neck, compressed gauze is going to work great. And really, compressed gauze is going to work great anyway. The reason for that is in our simulated wound channel here on what we call the baloney. This simulates a leg. And here's our gunshot wound right here. When the gauze goes in here, what we're doing, just like we use the tourniquet to compress the bleeding vessel by applying pressure, constricting the vessel. When we pack the gauze in here, we're using the pressure of the gauze to pinch off the bleeding vessel as well. And so if you were to use all 12 foot of this gauze to fill this wound, when it was pulled back out by a medical professional, only the last six to 12 inches is gonna have blood on it if you packed it properly. The rest of that material is filling up the void of the wound channel 
to apply pressure to the bleeding vessel so it pinches off the bleeding vessel. What we're not trying to do is to get a big sop and wet bloody mass of gauze inside of here. That's better than nothing. But really what we want to do is pack the wound full of gauze to apply pressure to the bleeding vessel. So this is a pressure bandage. This is our inert combat gauze trainer simulates a hemostatic agent. The 75th Ranger Regiment did a study on hemostatics versus compressed gauzes, $43, $3. They found no appreciable difference in the performance of these two products. That being said, I like hemostatics for injuries in the pelvic girdle region because the femoral arteries run through there and it's a very difficult place to render aid. And so if you have somebody with a puncture wound or a gunshot wound to the pelvic girdle, the hips essentially, not only are you dealing with a mechanical stoppage where the ball joint now doesn't work, but you have a bleeding vessel, the diameter of your thumb that's dumping out inside of that wound cavity, that's a really good place for hemostatics in my opinion. So let me talk you through how to wound pack, okay? And we train all this at Refuge Training as well. So come to class because this is information not instruction. Let me repeat, this is information, not instruction. So you're gonna open up your gauze like so, okay? And you'll see it's what's called Z-fold. So it runs back and forth like that, Z-fold. Now, real hemostatic gauze will have a blue line down the center of it, and that blue line is X-rayable, so that when this casualty gets to the hospital, a higher level of care, they X-ray the wound, they'll be able to see the gauze inside of the wound and that helps give them an idea of what the dimensions of the wound channel looks like on the x-ray. Because this is gonna come back out when they reach a higher level of care so that they can work on the casualty. This is impregnated with a hemostatic agent, meaning it's in the gauze. Back in the day, granules were used, like Celox granules, you'd rip this open and try and dump it into the wound. That has its downsides. First of all, this stuff reacts to any type of moisture, not just blood. So if you get it in your eyes or your mouth because the wind's blowing, you're gonna have a really bad day. So don't eat the combat gauze. If uh, the wind is blowing, you're trying to dump it in the wound and it's all blowing away, we're losing efficacy of the uh, hemostatic agent. And then in a combat setting, if we're dealing with rotor wash from a helicopter and we're trying to dump this into the wound, it's going all over the place. And so the industry has shifted from the use of granules to granules being impregnated in the gauze. The active hemostatic agent is in the gauze now. And when you pack the wound with the gauze, you're getting the hemostatic agent into the gauze. So the way this works is I'm going to, with my right hand, pull a little bit out, a foot or so, and I'm gonna hold the rest of my left hand and you can, if you want, tie what's called a power knot. So you're just gonna do an overhand knot in the end of this, like so. And what that knot will do is it allows you to centralize pressure on the bleeding vessel. And this is a hands-on thing. You're gonna get in here and you're gonna feel around for the bleeding vessel. You may feel the bone in there as well. You're gonna drive this knot to the bone, okay? I'm gonna hold pressure. I'm gonna keep my finger inside of here and I'm gonna hold pressure. I'm going to pull out another foot or so, get it over the top of here, and shove it in with my other thumb, or your fingers or your pinkies. It depends on the diameter of the wound, okay? Going to continuously hold pressure, pull out some more. I'm going to pack that wound like so, applying continuous pressure. And I'm not just pushing straight down, I'm pushing into every dimension every channel of the wound that I can feel. I want to fill up that wound as much as possible because it's not a one-dimensional wound. It's not a straight linear line through there, okay? So I'm going to keep pushing, keep pushing until that wound is entirely full and I've got gauze sticking out the top of the wound so I can't get any more in there. Again, constantly applying, applying pressure. If you have leftover gauze, Bunch it up over the top and hold pressure. Now I need my pressure bandage to hold this gauze in place. And so pressure bandages and hemostatics or compressed gauze go hand in hand. These two are like love and marriage. You can't have one without the other, okay? So now 
I need to maintain pressure on this wound, but I also need to get this open. So what I like to do is I'll drop an elbow on that and put down pressure on it so that I can take my time. And you'll notice on North American Rescue, these little red tabs all over their products, that's to direct your eye to rip right there so that this comes open. And this is a six inch North American Rescue emergency trauma dressing. This is essentially a big ace bandage with a big gauze pad inside of it, okay? So how this works is I'm gonna get the gauze pad over the top of the gauze, the wound packing gauze like so, and continue to apply pressure. Now, one of the reasons I really like North American Rescue is it has this intermittent hook and loop Velcro right here that's gonna keep this from unrolling and running away from you. That's really important because in a stressful situation, if this rolls all over the place and it runs away from me, that's gonna limit my ability to be effective as I'm rendering aid. So that it polices itself, it stays right here. Invariably, people are gonna ask, well, I'm sticking my dirty fingers inside of this wound, what about infection? First of all, if you can, you should be gloved up. Second, the first thing that's gonna happen when this casualty is moved to a higher level of care is they're gonna run broad spectrum antibiotics. That's part of what's called the March pause algorithm, P-A-W-S, P being pain management, A being antibiotics. And so immediately, this casualty is gonna get a course of broad spectrum antibiotics. There's already been foreign bodies inside of this person. That's what created the wound channel in the first place. And so the reason you're gonna glove up is less so that you are potentially imparting germs and nastiness to this casualty, and more because you don't want them imparting germs and nastiness to you. A good rule of thumb for us, if it's wet and not yours, don't touch it, okay? So bloodborne illness is a real thing. If you've been exposed to blood while you've been rendering aid, when EMS gets there, let them know and they have agents, they have chemicals on the back of the bus, the back of the ambulance that they can clean you with to limit your exposure to bloodborne illness, okay? So moving along, I'm gonna hold pressure on this. Dot, if you can come around over here, hold pressure on this. I'm gonna pull just enough, not a ton of pressure yet, just enough to get this around to this Velcro strip right here so that it'll stick, okay? Now it's on. Now I can use some pressure because this is a pressure bandage. So I'm going to pull and I'm going to twist and I'm going to center that twist over the top of the wound. I'm going to pull again and twist again and center that twist over the top of the wound so that I'm localizing the pressure here. We go from six inches wide to three quarters of an inch wide over the top of the wound. So I'm getting direct pressure on that wound. And I'll do a third time, pull and twist. And then I'm going to come around, continue wrapping. And you'll see on the end of this is a very large piece of Velcro, okay? I take that Velcro and press it down. Pressure bandage applied. So that's wound packing in a nutshell and pressure bandages. Pressure bandages, also known, many people call them Israeli dressings. It, it's the same concept. Um, but I really like these ETDs, emergency trauma dressings from North American Rescue. Olay's makes an, a phenomenal pressure bandage. We use those in some of our kits as well, in the stomp bags and the adventure kits. Uh, but I mean, the ETD, you know, here's a bare fact, 3.0. And if you pull this open and pop it open, there's a six inch North American Rescue emergency trauma dressing. Same thing, uh, it's the same concept, same exact product. So we're gonna back, anytime we wound pack, whether it's with compressed gauze or with a hemostatic agent, we're going to back that with a pressure bandage to hold that in and apply that pressure to pinch, to collapse the bleeding vessel so we stem the flow of blood. You can also use pressure bandages. For example, if you have uh, a not a critical wound, but a bad wound, you know, you can just simply wrap that up like so, wrap that wound up and you can apply as much pressure as needed. If it's a bad wound, apply a lot of pressure. 
If it's a not so bad wound, you just need to hold the dressing in place. You can apply less pressure. Like I said, this is just a big ACE bandage with a big piece of gauze on it. But they're absolute must haves in a trauma medicine kit because this addresses critical bleeds. And there's two tools in our toolkit we use for critical bleeds. In the extremities, we're going to use tourniquets. In our junctional areas, we're going to use pressure bandages and wound packing to pinch that bleeding vessel off. And then if you're out of tourniquets, yeah, you can wound pack and use pressure bandages second as a secondary course of action on an extremity. There's no such thing as too many tourniquets. So that's wound packing and pressure bandages. Um, highly versatile, relatively inexpensive. A pressure bandage is about 10 bucks. A pack of wound packing gauze is about three bucks, and there's really no good reason to not have them in your kit. Uh, they are a must have for addressing the M in the March algorithm, massive bleeding, because like I said, not every massive bleed can be dealt with with a tourniquet. And so if you have a wound in a junctional area, you need a pressure bandage and you need wound packing. Highly recommend you get a bunch of this stuff. I mean, that's the arc right here the advanced rip away kit. In this kit, not only do we have a uh, quick clot rolled gauze, but there's two packages of compressed gauze right down here for wound packing. And there's an S mark bandage right here, like the SWAT T for applying pressure as well. In addition to a mini compression bandage, that's a small one of these. So designed to treat multiple casualties in a very compact kit but it, it's that important. You need it, it's that important. You could have somebody bleed out from a critical bleed in their junctional area if you don't have a way to address that. And people will say, well, I'll rip my t-shirt up and I'll use that. Okay, you can do that. But the issue is in a critical event, a plan to improvise generally becomes a plan to fail. You'd be much better off spending a couple hundred bucks on a purpose-built kit or 60 bucks on a purpose-built kit and having the tools in your toolkit to be able to address these things without having to improvise. Um, you know, if you need a wood chisel, will a flat screwdriver work? Yes, it will. Is that why we created flat screwdrivers? No, they're for turning flathead screws. So having the right tool for the job is highly recommended. Please share this with everybody you think needs to see it. Thank you for following along. It's getting hot here in Eastern Oklahoma, I'm sweating. Uh, but I I'm happy to do this for you. I appreciate y'all greatly. Please share this with everybody you think needs to see it. If you're new here, subscribe and ring the bell icon, please. And uh, let's save as many lives as we can. Y'all have a blessed day. Shalom.